It's the end of February, and look at you. You made it. I'm so excited that you're here. We're going to talk about our picks for the best metal albums of February. Stick around. Kicking it off with Chapel of Disease, Echoes of Light. When I went into this record, I was expecting some sickening death metal, and most of us would, right? With some black metal overtones, I was new to this band, and boy, was I wrong, dude. This record defied every single one of my initial expectations. Sure, there are death metal roots here, but when they venture into that diverse subgenre territory, that's where the magic really happens on this record. Tracks like Gold Dust reminds me of Sumerlands and Tribulation, while songs like Shallow Nights just sound like an 80s ballad with dreamy vocals. When Chapel of Disease embraces metal, their aggression is a true sight to behold. The title track, Echoes of Light, is fun as hell. It shows the band's wild ability to adventure into unexpected territory. This album offers an intriguing and highly memorable experience throughout, surprising the hell out of me as a new fan. If you somehow missed this record, it is absolutely worth exploring, but if you go in expecting orthodox death metal, you might be unpleasantly or pleasantly surprised. Isan self-titled. The long-awaited self-titled record from this brilliant Norwegian musician takes a two-fold approach, Forge Mates, incorporating a cinematic orchestral experience alongside an extreme metal one. It's a no-brainer for anyone that's been following Isan since his days with Emperor, but how does that actually play out? Pretty f***ing good, don't you think? Uh, this is by no means my favorite record from Isan. That one I would have to give to his 2010 release after Amazing Album. Check out our Isan Albums Ranked video right here for more of our thoughts on that. So what makes this one stand out if there aren't really any crushing songs in particular or mind-blowing sections that stand out? I just lied about that part because there's plenty of mind-blowing sections here. And for one, I gotta say, it takes a lot of confidence to come out in 2024 and say, I'm gonna release an orchestral black metal album as if it hasn't been done 150,000 times since the early 2000s here. Isan is an OG in the symphonic black metal field, so of course it makes sense that he would eventually come around to this. The landscape of symphonic metal bands is much more saturated today, more than ever. So to create something that is worthy of being on its own, is definitely worth noting. This album ties in very nicely with this year's Borknagar release. There are a lot of similarities in how they approach their music with that icy cold Norwegian sound, blending in elements of 70s prog rock and never keeping their eye off of those extreme influences. Not an album to be missed this year for certain. Spectral Voice, Spragmos, man, these dudes truly captured a mesmerizing and also terrifying experience on this new sophomore album. Oh, 
delving deeper into death doom territory with spooky intensity and with clear influences from the funeral doom greats spragmos channels a fiendish atmosphere enveloping listeners in reverberating guitar chords and wild bass textures tracks like red feast condensed into one blend blast beats with unhinged vocals and this is where that contrast between slow and fast hits really hard for me Despite the album's density, Spragmos captivated me with its intricate development, challenging the listener to face its overwhelming force throughout. Slow moments like Be Cadaver and Death's Knell Rings Into Eternity completely enveloped me in sorrow. In its violence, this album has a strange beauty to it, making it one of the most compelling Death Doom experiences of a modern metal record. Spectral Voice achieves their goal, leaving listeners overcome and overwhelmed by the power of this sophomore album. Check it out. Bipolar architecture, metaphysicize. These German post-black metalers reached into the depths of my soul and pulled out what could be yet another early contender for album of the year. For me, this record has been getting a lot of love on metal sites on the internet and for damn good reason. I'm not well versed on musical theory to name the melodic structure that this band uses, but it's become a sonic trope in this and other genres where the key change goes from somber to slightly hopeful in this infinite loop. It never gets old for me. Bands like Rapture, Catatonia, Anathema, Paradise Lost, they all do it with magnificent results. This album leans into that structure, and guess what? It's magnificent, as always. This will surely intrigue anyone who loves Harakiri for the Sky, Panopticon, Russian Circles, and Downfall of Gaia. There are sprinkles of gent in there too with the way that the band plays with sound splicing and these wild digitized transitions that bust out a heavy hitting groove after a long passage of sad instrumentation. My only ding on this nearly perfect album is that the vocal dynamics are very one dimensional. The band seems to be either self aware of this or intentional in this flat delivery because there are long passages of instrumental music that give the album a lot of breathing room. If you're really caught up on the bland vocals, I think you're missing out on the bigger picture here. Check this one out. Necro Wretch, Swords of Dajal. This band rarely left my rotation this month. Unbelievably catchy, well-written, and well-produced black metal with heavy and death metal vibes sprinkled throughout the record. Necro Wretch draws inspiration from Islamic mythology, particularly the figure, I'm gonna put this on the screen because I will butcher the pronunciation, but also known as the Great Deceiver. Vlad's vocals are a huge highlight for me on the Swords of Dajjal. Being front and center and throaty and just pure fucking evil, dude. Contrasted against the melodic tremolo riffing, killer and catchy drum work, I was just enthralled from start to finish. Oh, oh, 
Clocking in at a tight 37 minutes, Swords of Dajjal avoids overindulgence, delivering a tight and intense set of tracks with absolutely zero fat on it. This is my first run with the band, and comparing against their last record, which I did scope, it's a huge step up, dude. This is a black metal album with an epic journey to it that everyone should experience if you're a fan of the genre. Sinister, yet viciously overwhelming. Swords of Dajjal should be in your playlist, my dudes. It might make my end of the year list for 2024, too. Borgnagar Fall. Well, Forge Mates, if you watched our Borgnagar tier list, you are probably here for my in depth review of their 12th studio release, Fall. And if you haven't watched that video yet, give this one a pause real quick and check that video out because they are one of our favorite bands and they have an incredible discography. Go ahead, I'll be here when you return, I promise. What I love about Borknagar is that they stand out as one of the premier Norwegian black metal bands alongside acts like Enslaved, In the Woods, Green Carnation, and Isan. Their ambition and steady flow of full-length albums is what put them on the radar. So what makes their newest one so great? These masters of ambition have pushed ahead even further, wonderfully incorporating bits of other genres such as trad slash power in doom metal on a very sparing occasion. And that makes some parts of this album hit super hard. The record, I would say, is very front-loaded with all their bangers in the very first half of the record. Like this one, Moon, one of our favorites. Due to that, the album kind of loses steam a bit with Stars Ablaze and Unraveling. But when Northward comes in, yeah, it grabs you by the guts and insists on your attention. I enjoy this record more with the second and third listen, especially having their whole discography in context very fresh in my mind. No chains can bind us, shackles can't hold. These guys have come a long way since their debut and are easily one of the top tier in their little niche subgenre. They deserve all the recognition and accolades. Great job, Oystein and crew. Ramavos, Spirits, man, this was a really cool album. I will say, don't throw this record on if you're looking to be immediately hooked. This is meant to be enjoyed as a somewhat spiritual, slow build experience, similar to bands like High Lung and Wardruna. In an era enamored with ancient cultures, Ramavos taps into Baltic traditions with absolute finesse. Starting as a solo project, the band's evolution into full ensemble speaks to their really compelling vision here. Tracks like The Sun and the Morning Star blend that modern metal intensity that I love with traditional elements, and that's where this album truly shines. What really stood out to me was the masterful guitar work throughout. With each song offering a unique experience for different reasons, World Tree shines with infectious grooves and Gregorian chant-like vocals. If you're a history nerd, and if you love metal that infuses cinematic feelings and that old ways spiritual vibe, this is definitely an album you need to check out. Obsidian Tongue, the Stone Heart EP. This is a longtime favorite band of ours, and if you've been following the channel since the beginning, first of all, thank you, Forge Mates. You might remember how we hyped their third studio album, Volume 3. 
check out a clip from that record. Yeah, and, that, and you have a little uh, insight. God, look how famished we were. That was right before COVID and lockdowns. And wow, this is like a totally different era of life. A lot happens in the span of four years, and while Obsidian Tongue hasn't necessarily shifted their sound, the addition of Falls of Roros drummer Ray and bassist vocalist Brian from Eve has truly spawned a new era for the band. Brendan Hader, the captain of the USS Obsidian Tongue, has always incorporated a psychedelic flair to the music, pulling at tropes created by The Doors, Electric Light Orchestra, or Pink Floyd. While this foundation still remains strong for the band, this EP proves that the band wants to get heavier and meaner. showcase a lot of EPs simply due to their short runtime, but this is one worth talking about. We're really excited for their next full-length release if this is the direction that they are going towards. Job for a Cowboy with Moon Healer. Their surprising shift in direction on their fourth album, Sun Eater, nearly a decade ago, caught me and a lot of people off guard. Despite retaining their trademark technical skill and highly aggressive edge, the incorporation of progressive elements brought a fresh complexity to their sound. And following a hiatus and their fifth release, Moon Healer has emerged, and oh boy, does it smash dicks. Stylistically, Moon Healer feels like a natural extension of its predecessor, appealing to fans of the contemporary progressive death metal sound. Job for a Cowboy continues to experiment boldly here, reaffirming their commitment to progressive metal influences while staying rooted in that absolutely killer death metal sound. Moon Healer showcases the band's confidence in exploration, blending aggression with intricate metal composition. I could not get enough of this damn record when I hit play. I let it go over and over and over again, and I think it's easily my favorite in their discography at this point. When we said a few months ago in this video that there is new death metal still changing the damn game and keeping things fresh, well, here's a beastly fucking example. Do not skip this record if you love death metal. Holder versus an Oath. The cold months are filled with black metal forge mates, and one of the best black metal albums of the month can easily be handed out to this band with their sophomore release via 20 buck spin. Check this shit out. What I love about some of the younger up and coming bands these days is that they really want to pay tribute to a wide swath of their influences. We were there at one point too. Sometimes that can be a jumbled mess, but with the right focus in production team, an album comes along that rightfully meanders the complexities of subgenres. <laughs> So apart from the savagery and misanthropic nature of black metal, Halder also explores the more mystical, dare I say, romantic, ah, no, no, romance, aspects of black metal, utilizing eerie synths and cavernous atmospheres. But of course, you're here for the metal, right? Well, this album doesn't shy away from that. The blast beats, tremolo picking, shrieking wails. They're all here in spades, don't worry. Just expect a more, a more varied ride throughout this 40 minute runtime. You'll be in for a nice treat. Just 
Chelsea Wolf, she reaches out to she. Okay, metal nerds. I know this isn't a metal record. This is an album that is heavy in the emotional sense, and many metal fans love Chelsea Wolf for her infectiously dark and melancholic vibes. As a fan of early industrial music and also goth rock, Chelsea Wolfe has spun her own take into a modern witchy adaptation that's as infectious as it is absolutely gorgeous. Wolf's latest album, She Reaches Out to She, produced by David Seatek, delves into the themes of surrender and hope amidst the chaos, and that feeling is captured perfectly in every damn song. While her music often explores darkness, offering guidance through the terror, it now embraces the unknown with confidence. Her previous works, her voice wasn't really the center of attention. The music was just this one big enigmatic emotional force. But in this new work, her gorgeous voice takes the center stage. taking us through a frightening, somber soundscape of sadness and acceptance. Though it's filled with introspective lyrics and absolutely haunting melodies, this is an album that has not left my rotation this month. Easily hit my album of the year list. Check it out if you're looking for something sad. What did you dig from February? Leave it down in the comments below. If you love this video, make sure you hit the like button. It really helps us out. Subscribe if you're new. Go with the gods, Forgemates. The Chapel of Disease awaits your penance.